Hi everyone, in this installment of Bite Size Learning, we are going to cover comprehensive genomic profiling. We will discuss at a high level what encompasses a comprehensive genomic panel versus a smaller targeted semantic panel. We start by defining what we mean by comprehensive genomic profiling. We follow that up with sample types that can be utilized, what variant types are commonly investigated, number of genes and targets typical to a panel, and why you would want to bring such an assay in-house versus sending samples out. Let's first start by defining what we mean when we say comprehensive genomic profiling. Here we state that comprehensive genomic profiling is critical for the identification and characterization of the unique somatic mutations that accrue in cancer cells. Comprehensive tumor and blood profiles can help to identify biomarkers that are prognostic or predictive, relevant in clinical trials, or cited in recent clinical studies. With that stated, we next need to understand what sample types are capable of being processed in current comprehensive genomic profiling assays. There are typically two main sample types, which include solid tumors or liquid biopsies. A solid tumor may be from fresh or frozen tissue, but more often is in the form of formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples, more commonly known as FFPE. These FFPE samples can be difficult to work with as extraction from such tissue can result in degraded material. It is important to know if a kit has been designed or tested to work with this tissue type specifically. Most kits will need an input in the tens of nanograms, so it will be necessary to test how many slices are needed to achieve this input amount with a solid tissue sample. On the other side is liquid biopsy, where nucleic acids can be obtained from such media as cerebral spinal fluid, but most commonly from an individual's blood. Again, it is necessary to know the input amount necessary for a kit and determine how much blood is required for the extraction of that specific amount of nucleic acid. Essentially, there will be an amount of nucleic acid extracted that is associated with a specific amount of blood taken, and that will be determined by the input of the assay you are utilizing. Unlike a tissue biopsy that provides information from only a fraction of the tumor, liquid biopsy provides insights about intra and inter tumor heterogeneity throughout the body. Once the tissue type and extraction methods have been determined, you can move on to what variants will be important in your investigation. So there are different variants and or biomarkers that can be targeted with a comprehensive genomic panel. And here we highlight a few of the most common. Small variants are the most commonly investigated variants and include single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, along with insertions and deletions, also known as indels. Copy number variations, or CNVs, are another common variant that are investigated in somatic panels. RNA fusions, for example, intract fusions, and RNA splice variants are other variant classes commonly investigated. Tumor mutational burden, or TMB, is a quantitative measure of the total number of mutations within an area of the tumor genome. Exome is the gold standard for TMB calling, so the larger the comprehensive genomic panel, the larger the area you will be interrogating and the more confidence you will have in calling TMB as high or low. Microsatellite instability, or MSI, is a measurement of accumulation of insertion and deletion errors within microsatellite repeat sequences in the genome. The more MSI sites that are interrogated in a comprehensive panel, the better you will be able to determine MSI. With each class of tumor, there are varying relevant biomarkers that have been identified in the research literature. Here we see some examples of genes that are associated with those varying tumor types. You can see that some genes overlap varying tumor types. For example, BRCA1 and 2 fall under the biomarkers for breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer. We can also see that INTRAC, which are again fusions, TMB, and MSI fall under the category of pan-cancer because they can be associated with a breadth of tumor types. Thus, a pan-cancer approach will utilize biomarkers that are unique or overlap a multitude of tumor types. When deciding on a panel, it is important to know the tumor type or types you are interested in and the biomarkers that are associated with them. This will help you determine the best panel to investigate the specific tumor type of interest. Let's talk now about the different types of oncology panels that can be utilized. First on the left, we have single gene panels. An example of this would be looking at a single gene like BRCA1 Many times for a single gene or a specific genomic target, groups will use qPCR instead of sequencing, depending on the throughput, because there is a trade-off in cost. Once you start looking at multiple SNP targets and or genes, then sequencing becomes much more cost-effective compared to qPCR. These panels will typically encompass anywhere from a few genes or targets up to 100 or so. Typically, these panels will focus on one or a few tumor types. When we speak to comprehensive panels, these are going to be very large in the hundreds of genes up to whole exome or even whole genome. These assays are typically pan-cancer and target a multitude of tumor types. 
Instead of running multiple single gene or multi-gene panels, researchers can run a comprehensive panel to identify specific genes garnered from the research literature related to a specific tumor type. Now we move on to some important aspects of the assay itself. When we choose a panel, whether it be a single gene, multi-gene hotspot, or comprehensive panel, we want to make sure we have a high sensitivity and specificity for the level of detection we are aiming to achieve. An example would be if the specificity were low, then our amplicon or enrichment baits would capture a lot of off-target regions. This would require us to do additional sequencing versus an assay with higher specificity to attain the same sensitivity and level of detection or LOD. Also noted here is that the higher the specificity, the lower chance of having false positive calls within a sample or assay. Tumor cells will only represent a small portion of a sample, so the variants and transcripts associated with these cells may only be present at low frequencies, also known as variant allele frequencies or VAFs. Because of this, an assay to test for this must be able to detect variant allele frequencies in these low ranges, and we term this the level of detection of an assay, which is the lowest frequency of variant it can confidently detect. The suggested level of detection will vary from test to test, but typically a solid tumor panel will shoot for a level of detection of 5%, and a liquid biopsy panel will try to attain a level of detection of around 0.5 to 1%. This is the lower end of variant allele frequency that an assay will confidently be able to call a variant. The discrepancy between levels of detection are in relation to the tissue itself. With solid tumor, we are taking cells directly from the excised tumor versus liquid biopsy where we are interrogating the blood for shed tumor that will be in relatively lower abundance since it is not directly from the tumor tissue. Because of these low levels of detection in somatic panels, a significant amount of sequencing is usually required to attain this and the high levels of coverage that are often wanted to confidently call these variants. We won't go over it here, but to get to these low levels of detection, unique molecular indexes, or UMIs, are typically added to an assay to allow for read stacking that assists in calling these low levels of detection. The sample preparation workflow itself is similar for both a solid tumor and liquid biopsy assay. In this example, we are looking at a general workflow for a comprehensive genomic profiling assay. We already talked about tissue type, extraction method, and input amounts, but it's important to also know if you will need either DNA or RNA or both for the assay you choose to move forward with. Once you have your input material, most assays will take two to three days to complete the library preparation before sequencing analysis. Some labs choose to do the library prep manually as there may only be a handful of samples at a time, but there are options for automation that the lab would like less hands-on steps that could possibly lead to less variability downstream. Once the libraries are completed, they will be run on the appropriate sequencer depending on the number of samples and reads necessary to interrogate the panel at the appropriate depth of coverage. The next Seq 550 and 550DX, the next Seq 1000 and 2000, and NovaSeq 6000 are all good Illumina instrument fits for these types of assays and sample numbers. After sequencing, variant analysis will need to be performed and some of this will be predetermined with out-of-the-box kits, but users may choose to develop their own custom pipelines to do this. Once you have a list of variants for each sample, those will need to be interrogated to determine which are relevant to the tumor type and which are determined to be variants of unknown significance or VUSs. The last thing we want to talk about is why you would want to bring an assay like this in-house. One of the most important reasons that we will note first is that you control the turnaround times related to a sample instead of being at the mercy of a send-out lab. A turnaround time of about five days is very achievable for comprehensive genomic profiling versus sendouts that can keep you waiting for sometimes weeks. The second advantage is that you have complete control over the handling of the sample. For a sendout lab, you run the risk of there being an issue with the transport of said sample to the sendout facilities. When this is local, there are less worries of something happening to the patient sample while in transit to the lab. The next key point is that your institution will own the data. In the age of genomics, data can be valuable, so owning your own data can be advantageous in the long run. This also allows you to reanalyze the data at a later time if you would like, or use it for research if the institution has a research arm. Send out labs typically will only provide a report and you won't have access to the data at a later date. Hopefully this has been a worthwhile introduction into what a comprehensive genomic profiling assay is, what it can encompass, what is needed to perform one, and how it could benefit your institution locally. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next bite-sized learning talk.